All right, good evening, everyone. Or is it afternoon? I guess it's evening now. It's after five. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the LPG for Clean Cooking, Pursuing a Just Transition and Climate Gains breakout session, where essentially the panel standing between you and drinks. So we'll do our best to keep you energized and engaged uh, for the next hour or so. My name is Anibo Kraga. I'm the Executive Secretary for the African Refiners and Distributors Association. You might be wondering what a refiner is doing up here talking about LPG, but actually refineries produce LPG, and uh, we believe in my association that LPG for clean cooking is Africa's best near-term option for reducing Africa's um, carbon footprint. I have an esteemed panel today I'm going to introduce, and the way the session is going to run essentially is um, I'll introduce the panel, frame the session, I'll ask them a couple of questions, and then hopefully we have some time for a little Q&A at the end. So I'll start um, from here and I'll just work down and introduce. Um, sitting right beside me on my right is Rob Bayliss. Uh, he's a senior scientist at the Stockholm Environment Institute, SCI, and um, his research focuses on relationships between energy, social welfare, and ch environmental change in developing countries. And his current work focuses on biomass energy, and actually he provides some of the scientific feedback that we're gonna be sharing today on why LPG for clean cooking is actually good for the climate. So welcome, Rob. There we go, there we go. Uh, right beside Rob, we have Sheila Addo, who's uh, the Director of Policy Coordination for the National Petroleum Authority, MPA in Ghana. MPA is, is Ghana's downstream regulator, and Sheila has been very involved in the implementation of various downstream policies, including the design and implementation of the national LPG policy that's based on the branded cylinder recirculation model. Sheila, welcome. Next to Sheila, we have Elizabeth Mushuri, who is the Director of East Africa for the Global LPG Partnership, which is an EU-funded leader in the sector focused on national LPG sector development. They've done various studies in different countries in Africa, including Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda. Welcome, Elizabeth. <laughs> and last, but definitely not least, we have Louis de Milder, who is the head of Big B Box in Africa. I must point out that B-Box started three years ago in the DRC, and they were actually trying to sell solar energy and solar panels. But based on the innovative work they've done, they're actually um, a leader in LPG marketing, pay-as-you-go LPG marketing in Africa right now, and they're uh, working on covering clean cooking operations across various markets on the continent. Louis, welcome. So let me do some scene set before we jump into um, the questions that I'm going to ask my panelists. You know, when you, when you talk of clean cooking, um, usually LPG, there's a lot of pushback against investments in LPG. And the question is why? Well, everybody looks at it as a fossil fuel and fossil fuels are bad and so on and so forth. Well, the reality is that um, LPG actually represents one of the most affordable and accessible clean fuels in many contexts. And today we're going to look at the climate and environmental impacts of LPG to see if, when it comes to expanding LPG um, access for clean cooking, we will have to sacrifice climate goals and other benefits that come from a clean cooking access. Um, I'm sure you'll agree with us by the time we're done with this panel that that is not the case, and we really should drive to increase LPG for clean cooking investments. At the opening plenary today, uh, Fatih Birol of the IEA mentioned we need $6 billion per year between now and 2030 to effectively address clean energy access in Africa. It's interesting that the biggest fund that we are all proud of is Spark Plus, but it closed at $40 million. So I hope as we go through this, you'll see why we need to drive up investments in the sector, and also we actually have climate gains from that. So I'm going to start, my first question is to you, Rob. And essentially, um, you've recently completed a study on the climate impacts of transitioning to clean cooking, and LPG for cooking is among the fuels you analyzed. What will the climate impacts of a full global transition to LPG for clean cooking look like?
I'm glad you asked. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so, right, we did this analysis, and we did it for many of the reasons you just described. And I just want to lay a little bit of the groundwork without going into a lot of detail. I just I gave a 40-minute presentation on this yesterday with 25 slides, graphs, figures, everything. And I'll try and do the, the two-minute version now with the understanding that I need to skip over a, a lot of the, the gory details. Um, so basically, we, we compare two scenarios. Instead of just looking at like one cook doing one thing and one cook doing another thing, that's not really a good way to assess this. Uh, we're trying to understand how the whole world will evolve. Um, so we built a scenario in which things continue to happen as, if they, as they currently are. So some people are up taking LPG, others are continuing to cook with polluting fuels, uh, and we rolled this scenario forward some two decades. And then we created a scenario in which everyone over time in low and middle income countries shifts over to LPG. And then we compare the emissions that occur under the first scenario to the emissions that occur under the second scenario. We also took those emissions and fed them into a, a simplified but still fairly complicated climate model. And that climate model gave us what the global temperature would do under those two different scenarios. And we look at the difference between those two things. So that's just you know, very, very quick and dirty description of, of the, the science that we, that we did. And what we find is the full transition to LPG results in a tremendous reduction in most pollution. Not all, but most, and particularly the pollutants that we care about that um, contribute to radiative forcing, which is a complica complicated way of saying they, they change the global temperature. Um, plus, there's a lot of overlap between those pollutants and pollutants that are, health, that, that are damaging to health. Um, so it reduce, uh, results in a huge reduction in health damaging pollutants too. I can list them uh, while they're here. Um, and ultimately we find cumulative CO2 emissions and CO2 equivalent emissions of uh, well-mixed greenhouse gases like nitrous oxide and methane decrease by over two gigatons, over two billion tons in comparing the business as usual to this alternate scenario in which everybody shifts to LPG we allowed a little bit of electricity to stay in there, too, for, for reasons that I can explain. Um, so cumulative emissions over two gigatons uh, reduction, which is a really quite a considerable reduction of, of greenhouse gases. And we find the global mean temperature is actually a little bit cooler, just a tiny bit cooler, under the LPG scenario than it would be under a business-as-usual scenario. I can go into the gory details of why that is. It's mostly because of what we call short-lived forcers. Black carbon and organic carbon, carbon monoxide plays a role too. It's not so much the, the contribution of the CO2 reduction. That would materialize in a longer-term outlook if we modeled out another two, three, four decades. Okay, so it's primarily from the short-lived forcers. Um, but it's a, it's a temperature reduction nonetheless. Rob, thank you very much. So two key takeaways, one, it reduces pollutants, and two, it reduces temperature. So we're starting to get on a roll here as, as we go through this. I think I, I just want you to expand a little bit more on, on, on this question, uh, Rob. So one criticism of expanding LPG for clean cooking is that we should not be taking actions that increase gas demand. So I, I think you answered it, but maybe you could just reemphasize this for me. How much would full transition to LPG for cooking contribute to global gas demand? Global gas demand. So in terms of the, the, the overall yeah. um, contribution or, or demand for LPG. Honestly, I don't have that number on a... Okay. <laughs> I should, well, you I know should, what? should have studied you're, your... Uh... You're, you're off the hook because you told us that we reduce pollutants <laughs> and you told us that we reduce temperature. Yeah. That's all we need right now. But thank right. you very much. So, I'll be happy to so, follow up later. No, no, let's go. No, let's go. So uh, shifting gears. Um, Sheila, let's bring this home since we're in Ghana. Um, could you tell us some of the key barriers to expanding access to LPG for cooking in Africa from your experience? Okay, great. Um, thank you, Anibal. Pretty much um, LPG for clean cooking in Africa is, is um, the easiest thing to uptake. There are other alternatives. There's ethanol, there is um, natural gas, there is... Um, well, ethanol, natural gas, and electricity, but the kind of infrastructure that we have set up already makes it easier for us to uptake LPG, I mean, for clean cooking in Africa, and then for quick uptake of, um, of clean, a cleaner alternative to biofuels or to biomass. 
Um, if you look at Ghana, for example, we've set up a good infrastructure in terms of the distribution system um, the, to ensure availability and accessibility of the fuel to many consumers. If we wanted to push or pursue natural gas as it is right now, we don't have the infrastructure to set up natural gas into people's homes and, and help them use it as a cooking fuel. Um, ethanol, as an alternative, isn't also fully developed. Um, in most countries in Africa, Ghana, if I use our example. And so it's easier to latch onto LPG, even though it is a fossil fuel, it's a cleaner form of fossil fuel, and it is an easier fuel to quickly uptake um, a cleaner cooking fuel. Well, thank you, Sheila. So the, uh, very good points. Cleaner fuel, easy uptake, which tells us why LPG is critical for Ghana's uh, energy transition agenda. Um, Elizabeth, let's take it beyond Ghana, okay? What are some of the key barriers to expanding access to LPG for cooking in Africa in general from your experience? Uh, thank you, Anibal, for the question. What are the greatest barriers to access to LPG in Africa? One of the greatest barriers is policy in the sense that if we do not have the right policy and people get access to LPG, then it produces uh, unsafe uh, conditions, which then become a barrier. But the real barrier is policy. And when governments have set up the right policy, we've seen uh, adoption of LPG. Uh, I'll give an example of uh, this country, and Sheila is my witness, that uh, LPG adoption in Ghana was very quick, but uh, after a while, uh, there were incidents, and now they had to change the policy and say this is the way LPG should be done. And I would also like to give examples from East Africa. Uh, countries that have been very clear with policy like Kenya and Rwanda, we've seen a quick acceleration of adoption of LPG. And where the policy has not been very clear, the growth has been more or less uh, sluggish. Uh, so policy is very, very important to the growth of LPG and for safety and for adoption. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Lewis, given, you know, I, I started by talking about um, the innovation that you've, uh, your company B-Box has brought into Pago and, and, and all of that, especially given where you started from. Um, question I have is, can you tell us some ways in which innovative business models are helping to overcome the barriers that Elizabeth just mentioned? Yes, but f first of all, so B-Box, we don't have an, an LPG background. Um, we are a solar home system company. We are operating across 10 countries. And uh, everywhere, it was the same feedback from the customers. TV, TV is working well. The lights are really changing our life. But we need something to cook and to iron. So at the beginning, we had no, uh, no answer to that, to that need. And then we were thinking, we did our homework, and we said, OK, how can we provide cooking energy? And it's where that we found out reading a bit all the research and so on, that actually LPG was the one of the best alternatives we can have uh, access today, and, uh, that we can scale. Because it's also important, we are always thinking what we can scale, and we can scale quickly, like right now, in the coming, coming months, coming years, and not in 10 years' time. So it's why we started to engage into uh, LPG, and that's why we focused into LPG. And talking with our clients or, or customers, we see they need two things with LPG. First is they need uh, affordability with, with cooking. They need affordability. If it's not affordable, they cannot cook with that. Then they need accessibility. If you cannot access that quickly, because when you run out of cooking fuel, you need, you need to find a more cooking fuel to continue to cook. Uh, if, it's, if it's not accessible, they will reject as well. And then, so th this is a challenge we need to, to overcome with an innovative business model. But then on the other side, what they, what they want is something that is really quick, so you can really cook quickly, and also super clean, no fumes, no dust. And LPG itself has a gas, like it's perfect for that. Super quick and super clean for the, the experience of the customer. And then the challenge is to make it affordable and available for everyone. So the way we see the distribution of, of, uh, of clean cooking is not like selling LPG only to the top of the pyramid, only to the rich, the, the people in the city centers that can afford LPG and having a healthy margin on them, so our business is profitable. The way we are 
designing an, an innovative business model, it's just designing an inclusive business model. So we are thinking how we can sell LPG to the mass, so to the middle of the pyramid as well. And the, what we do with Solar Home System, what we master is doing asset financing. So it's what we have been doing for more than 10 years. We have a, a platform, a software for that. And uh, we manage the uh, like a pay as you go uh, uh, on solar. And we apply the same concept uh, to, uh, to LPG with micro loans, asset financing on the stoves, on the cylinders over different period of time and a different amount then of technology if it's a, a longer period of time. Thank you very much, Lloyd. I think very, very, very important points. You kind of have to create an inclusive model where you help asset financing and, and, and so on. I mean, when you think of the countries that are really, really um, seeing significant uptake in LPG, Ghana, of course, definitely, but uh, elsewhere in uh, West Africa, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, my home country, Nigeria, Kenya, and other places, Rwanda, you, 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 you can see that demand is really, you know, really picking up um, across the board. In fact, um, with the Clean Cooking Alliance and Shell Foundation, Arda managed a uh, study on Nigeria and Ghana, where we kind of looked at what's going on here, what's the future look like, and what are some of the demand drivers. For example, LPG demand has grown in Nigeria by 732%, and uh, in Ghana by 55% over the last decade or so. But when you look at what are the factors, the structural factors that building on what Lewis said, that are actually impeding this really, this uptake. Affordability, you mentioned starter pack costs, anywhere from 35 to to $100. Biomass availability, still readily available and it's easy to buy in small amounts as needed. Lack of proximity from skids, lack of pay as you go. And when I first heard about pay as you go, you know, I was in Nigeria, I had never heard about it, but I was very excited about it, which is, I first heard about pay as you go a couple of years ago, we were part of this, a coalition of companies, Clean Cooking Alliance, Shell Foundation, that came together to look at these opportunities. And single cylinder ownership, where as soon as gas cuts out, people still go back to biomass. There are other factors as well. Regulatory, for example, import duties, VAT, reduces affordability, customs clearance, key issue as well. And then cultural factors, the taste. A lot has been said about Nigeria and Ghanaian jollof. Irrespective of the jollof, the ones that you ask the masses that they really, really like, I can assure you, there's charcoal involved. Can you get them weaned off that taste? The fear of explosions, people are still scared of them. And last but not least, just plain education. You could give people free cylinders and they still won't use them for a number of reasons. So I think there are a number of things we have to do as we move forward to really drive the LPG story um, in a sustainable manner across the continent. So thanks, panelists, for the first uh, round of questions. <laughs> and now, I hope you guys are still awake, I see. Okay, great, great, great. So I'll just, I'll, I'll just move into the next uh, set of questions. Uh, th this next set is for Sheila and Elizabeth, and I'll ask you both the same question. What are some other successful examples that we've seen, some examples of national government action or public-private uh, sector partnerships or other initiatives that we've seen that can help us overcome these barriers? So Sheila, start okay. with you. So because I'm an expert on the Ghana example, I'll dwell a bit more, permit me to dwell on the Ghana no, example. No problem. Um, we've, since the late 80s, um, from about 1989 thereabout, government has had um, a persistent, intentional policy to push LPG uptake in the country. And so we've pushed the LPG availability conversation by making sure that we've expanded on infrastructure, on storage infrastructure, and port infrastructure. Um, because we do not produce enough locally for our consumption, and so storage has gradually gone up. Um, accessibility, we've managed to make sure that there's also infrastructure that can sell LPG closer to people um, um, around the neighborhoods. There's also, so that has given a clear policy focus. Now that policy has also been revised, as you must have heard several times. We're talking about the new LPG promotion policy, which is based on the cylinder recirculation model, as well as um, some sort of social intervention, which we call the um, National LPG Promotion Policy. Um, we're moving, so there's a direct, clear, intentional policy focus to shift the market from single um, cylinder use to a cylinder recirculation model, and then have low-income consumers also match up. There's support for the startup toolkit that um, Louise mentioned. So 
you would notice that people struggle to uptake LPG because they have to purchase cylinders, purchase cook stoves. Government is meeting that gap by, you know, meeting low-income people with some cook stoves. Apart from that, now you are looking at the consumers, but then what happens to the investors? We do have, um, what Ghana has been able to do is that we took off subsidies from LPG completely. Um, and also, apart from taking off the subsidy from LPG, we do have a full cost recovery pricing. So if you're an investor and you're establishing any sort of LPG infrastructure in the country, there's a process that helps you recover your cost of investment without government debt on subsidy. Um, we've done a lot of consumer education and awareness campaigns. Even this, it is a lot of work. Even with this, Ghana's LPG uptake is pretty much just about 37%, 38% of the consumer population. The drive is to make sure that by 2030, we're hitting 50% and then driving it up further. Now, beyond Ghana, I've seen some other country examples because there are other countries that would argue that at least to make sure LPG is cheaper, affordable um, to consumers, try and have some sort of subsidy um, program for low-income consumers. And so there's a good example in India. They have a rebate system where the consumer is paid back um, the low-income consumer. So it's targeted subsidy um, towards low-income consumers in Thailand, El Salvador, Peru, pretty much having a targeted subsidy approach. And so these are some of the things that work. Um, making sure it's investor friendly so that the investors will work in making sure there's availability, accessibility. Affordability also means you look at the price. And for low income consumers, you sort of have a targeted intervention for them. And that's been our experience so far. And it's worked. We've had some uptake since 2017 to now. We've moved up from about 24% LPG uptake to about 37% LPG uptake, even without fully launching the cylinder recirculation model as we envisaged. Thank you, Sheila. Very, very impressive. Um, and I think it uh, tells us that if you put the right types of policies in place, you will actually get the kind of uh, results that we're looking for. So, Elizabeth, same question. So, uh, talking from Kenya, We've had some uh, experiences uh, in the 90s. We used to have our own refinery, which was not producing enough LPG, but the demand was growing because every educated person, every person who had a degree did not want to go back home and start using charcoal. And uh, that created a demand that uh, LPG was being imported, but we didn't have uh, in, enough import infrastructure for handling it. And in 2002, 2003, the government decided uh, to invite our private investors to put up an import infrastructure, which was done. And the moment that infrastructure was ready, then uh, we saw the LPG volumes uh, dramatically go up. But that was not the only thing. The government also standardized the cylinder sizes and valves because um, there were, we had different valves for every company and we had different cylinder sizes, which were quite confusing to customers. Customers didn't know whether they were buying 10 kgs or 13 kgs or 15 kgs, so that they became standardized. And then we did something which, uh, a policy which ended up being a mistake because um, we also allowed the interchange of cylinders. Uh, customers are not filling the cylinders on the spot as what was happening in uh, Ghana, but a uh, customer was allowed to go and buy whatever brand that was available. And that created uh, a parallel system of people who are illegally feeding other cylinders that did not belong to them. And it became such a problem that uh, marketers no longer invested in cylinders. And uh, we had issues with only the few cylinders circulating and uh, people fighting over those cylinders, robberies and stealing and so on. Uh, so that was reversed and now customers generally exchange the cylinders that they have. And as soon there, as there was wind that that uh, uh, rule was going to change in 2018, we saw the volumes dramatically grow up, go up, and uh, we have uh, nearly doubled the volumes from 2018 to what we had in 2021. Uh, so that is a, a policy change, uh, influencing the investment, influencing in investment in uh, infrastructure and in cylinders, and also in the number of marketers that are in the, that are in the market. I would also say the same applies to the valves. The valves are still standardized, so generally, if you have two cylinders, you can still interchange one from the other and that has been uh, very positive. Uh, the regulations also have gone with that change, it's not just verbal, and there are huge penalties to anybody who is uh, cross-filling or who anybody who is uh, even transporting cylinders that do not belong to their brand. 
Uh, going a little bit further, I would say the same thing is uh, happening in uh, Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda uh, did what Kenya is doing, but because they were doing it after Kenya, they already learned the lessons, and therefore I would say at this point they are ahead of Kenya in terms of regulation and implementation and the partnerships that they are invest of pa people who are investing in the LPG sector. Thank you. Th thank, thank you, Elizabeth. I think Rob had, a, he had some comments he wanted to add to the discussion. Thanks, Eddie Boy. I feel like I need to redeem myself for not having the, uh, the answer before. Although, although I did a little calculation, so I think the, the answer to your previous question that I, that I flubbed uh, is between 150 and 200 million tons. About. If that sounds reasonable? That's why for, I sit close to him all the time. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to add something about the India program that you mentioned. I, I participated in a fairly extensive study of it. And the, one of the key things they did, well, two things. So they were targeting, and targeting is difficult, right? But they have a whole system of national identifications that's linked to a biometric ID set up. So that infrastructure is essential if you want to target well, I think. And the other aspect is they, they not only subsidize the cylinder cost, and that actually they didn't subsidize, subsidize sufficiently. So uptake was still iffy, but they did subsidize access to the kit, you know, the, the cylinder, the, the stove, all the, all the equipment plus the, the, the cost, the licensing, and they facilitated that process for the poorest families, um, you know, families that are officially designated as below poverty line. And they really succeeded in getting 80 million households, and actually 90 post-COVID, 90 million households access. So imagine that's like, what, 350 million people. Um, they have, so now they have access, but they don't necessarily use it because the, the cost of a refill is still quite high for, uh, you know, for a very poor family. Um, th thank you very much, Rob. Um, an interesting point you raised. I, I, I think one thing we need to really, really think about is, again, coming back to the study that Clean Cooking Alliance um, sponsored, how do we remove the last mile barriers? So when you're in Accra, it's great. When you're in Nairobi, it's great. When you're in Abidjan, when you're in Lagos. But how do you get beyond there? to the low-income rural areas? How do you remove these barriers? And um, t t to maybe shed some light on that, Lewis, maybe you can. Um, from your experience and the success you've had, what needs to happen between governments, the private sector, and NGOs to create a vibrant market for clean cooking solutions? Um, but of course, we need the... the but the, the LPG, the kg of LPG must be as cheap as possible. And I think, like we saw, we have a graph where we really see the consumption per customer because we have end user data. When we increase by 10% the, the price of LPG uh, in February this year, then the consumption goes down. When we increase again, plus 10% of the end user price, consumption go down again. So it's really like the, the best way to, 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 to support the uptake of LPG within a household is to make it very affordable. And there is two ways, but of course we can, th there is the global market, uh, government can reduce the import taxes, remove the VAT, things like that. But then the, the margin a, a, a marketer of LPG, a distributor of LPG is making, uh, needs to cover the, the distribution cost. So it's really the refilling cost, moving the cylinders to the, the point of sales or even to the customers. And also the government can, uh, can put a, an, an enabling environment there is low cost, so no like good hold, um, no too many taxes when you open a shop, or when you have also you need a license to do the transport. So we are operating in three countries, and we can see it's like from a country to another, the operating cost is very different. So this structural investment in the economy, but also like not having too many license to pay and things like that, can also improve the the, 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 the low cost. But of course. Um, it's very hard to compete in, in rural setting with LPG. Um, we need we will need then a super cheap uh, gas. I think it's possible in some countries where they subsidy, that there is a subsidy on the LPG itself. It's the government that import the LPG and that resell it to the distributors at a discounted price. Then the LPG is cheap, and then you can go to the to the rural areas. And then what we are uh, trying to do as well, but we haven't scaled yet, is really the metering, so the pay as you go on the gas, pay as you cook. But the, the issue with that is the meter is super expensive. So uh, we have another, okay, it's fine. We can, the, the, the customer can pay step by step, but at the end of the day, if we need this business model to be sustainable uh, 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 over the time, but we need to have a smart meter that is really cost effective. 
which is not the case today, but we know that the industry will continue to grow and maybe and hopefully we can find um, and develop like low cost math meters in the future. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Louis. I, I think you, you two things. Uh, so one of the things ARDA has is an LPG work group, and we work with quite a few of the folks here, including the Global LPG Partnership. And one of the first things we looked at in our first virtual workshop last year was how do we create an African LPG market for Africa? And what do we mean by that is we have African countries that produce LPG, yet you have others that import. How do we create an ecosystem where we can actually ensure that as much of the LPG is that's produced in Africa stays in Africa? That's the first thing. The second thing, you know, talks about investments, and I think this is where the DFIs really come into play. And a, an interesting statistic: um, everybody talks about. I saw that some of the partners this morning, the Africa Development Bank, which is great, the Africa Finance Corporation, which is great, and Africin Bank, right? It will interest you to know, and you can check this, there's an interesting article by Wise and Case that actually checks out the association of African DFIs. There are at least 67 other DFIs in Africa, X those three. When you look at the total quantum, there are 80 DFIs. So the question is, how do we get as many of these DFIs to investment grade so they can support these kinds of projects and serve as um, leaders for private capital to follow to actually deploy this. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's pretty much uh, um, what we had in terms of questions. And, and, and now we find out if you've actually been listening and if you have any burning questions on your mind. Um, oh, fantastic. I see a question over there. But please, please state your name and what your question is at this point. Thanks. Thank you uh, to the panelists. My name is Ada from the AECF. Um, I have two questions. One is on the safety and the security of transporting LPG, like let's say if you serve slums areas where the roads are not uh, quite narrow or not very well tarmacked, or if you go more in remote areas, like is this a problem? Is this adding to the cost of delivering LPG? And have you seen or heard of accidents uh, with, with the gas. Um, and then the second question has uh, more to do with, with the current f fuel crisis and um, maybe you can help us understand how much is LPG being affected in terms of increases of cost, maybe in the Ghanaian market for, for a concrete example. And do you have ways to mitigate this, this um, increases? Do you have stock or are you buying at a set price? How do you deal with it? So Sheila, did you want to take that? Uh. Right, Elizabeth will take the safety, but I'll take the, since I have the mic, I'll take the, the pricing issue. Um, so yes, affordability is a problem and the economic cost of LPG is a problem. Although we're trying to have um, some sort of intensive awareness campaign to tell um, to try and convince people to switch from biomass to LPG, looking at the total cost of using biomass being higher than just the economic cost of LPG. But we are not, um, we're not blinded to the fact that it must be affordable. That is why there are several government projects to take away the initial cost of the startup kit, which is the initial cost of um, the cook stove. Um, we're switching to a model where consumers do not have to procure cylinders and own cylinders anymore. In addition, there are conversations ongoing for government to look at the taxes and the price buildup of LPG. Um, because with the introduction of this new cylinder recirculation model, remember I mentioned we do have a full cost recovery pricing. There are at least two levels of investments in there, bottom plants and cylinders that must be recovered. And so if we do not find a way to bring LPG prices down, or at least let it remain the way it is, we would end up increasing prices and then having a counter effect on consumption. And so there are conversations ongoing to look critically at the taxes on LPG and try and take some off so that um, it helps the uptake. So three things we're doing, looking at the taxes and the price itself. Number two, consumer education to tell people about a higher cost 
um, health costs, social costs to using biomass. And then number three, government is actually supporting low-income consumers with the startup kits. That's the cook stove and the accessories to the cylinders. So let me handle the question on uh, safety. Uh, safety is key to LPG. And that's why when I started, I said about uh, policies, setting safety, and setting a cell ownership, like what Ghana is trying to do. Uh, the reason is that when a cylinder goes back to the marketer, the brand owner, the cylinder owner, it goes through what is called pre-field checks. The person who is filling the cylinder checks that cylinder to make sure that it is safe, the valves are okay, the handles are fine, there's no dent, and if it's the dent, how big is the dent, and so on. Then during the filling process, it is also goes through uh, some inspection, and after it is filled, it also goes through inspection, and we put a sticker to say that cylinder is safe to go to the market. Now, if the person who is doing this is doing this as the customer is waiting, and this, it is unlikely that that person also has the knowledge and the time to do all those proper inspections, then it does not happen. So, so that is important. The other thing is about cylinder maintenance. A cylinder is a metal, and after some time there is wear and tear, the handles uh, get bent, the foot rings get bent, and that compromises safety on how the cylinder is going to be sitting, wherever it is sitting. And then the final thing is about the cylinder. It goes through a heating process, the paint is removed, the handles are removed, and new ones are put, and it is marked. Different countries have uh, different standards. I think in uh, India it could be five years, in uh, Brazil it is 10 years for, or 15 years for a new cylinder, uh, 10 years for another cylinder, and so on. So, cylinder maintenance is very, very important, and of course, then they said, as I said, the cylinder standards. Now, that makes the LPG a little bit more expensive than if the customer was walking to a filling station and getting the cylinder filled. But if you consider the cost of the customer going to wait for the cylinder to be filled as they are waiting, do we factor in that time and how much does that time cost the customer? But the most important one is, if that safety is compromised and you have an accident, what is the cost of that accident? Thank you. Thank you very much, Sheila Elizabeth. Um, gentleman in front. Thank you very much. My name is Philip. I'm the founder of PayGas in South Africa. And what is interesting in South Africa is you've got the both model, the recirculation cylinder and the refilling. So the challenge of the recirculation uh, cylinder is you need a lot of cylinder per client. So uh, if I want to serve Adibo, you need to have one empty with you, one full at the store. But to have one ready for you, I got one cylinder going to the filling plant one other filling plant, so it's about four to five cylinder in rotation in working stock to serve one client. Meaning for Ghana, if you've got 30 million people, you need about 150 million cylinder. And in this, this is a good point of the recirculation is a safety, because it's the ownership of the cylinder. But in the meantime, um, it's a question is for Sheila. Why not considering corporate owned cylinder, but that you can refill? In this case, you keep one for one, one cylinder for one client, but also you keep the safety of the cylinder is owned by the company. So my question is just, why not considering the both model? Or do you? Okay, so if I got you clearly, you're asking why we don't have a corporate owned cylinder that can always come back to be refilled. Um, so that is what, if, if I get, that's exactly what we're doing with cylinder recirculation model. The company, the
the cost a little bit. We're exploring the pay as you cook option that Luis is also talking about. So I, I'm not sure how it works if a company owns a cylinder because we're talking about cylinders into homes and LPG consumption in households. So in Ghana, when we're counting the accessibility, we're counting it based on the households that have access. So I, maybe I didn't quite get your question, but the way we want to push the uptake is to into homes. And so we're expecting that the cylinders will be refilled and sent into homes owned by companies, branded by companies, and they will take responsibility for the cylinders, even look at taking up insurance um, so that if there's some sort of safety accident in homes, they're responsible for the brand and then they pay for um, whatever compensation or whatever issues. And there's a tracking system, there's a proper batching system to make sure that any cylinder that comes into my home, for example, can be traced from the point of maintenance to the point of filling, transportation and all of that back to my home. So I'm not sure we can run away from having multiple cylinders per client. Um, that's, that's my question, my answer from top. Uh, I would like to add that uh, it is ideal for people to have multiple cylinders, but it's not necessarily a must. Uh, if I look at the example of Kenya, we have uh, retail outlets all over the country. Uh, from my house to the nearest gas uh, retailer is less than uh, 100 meters. And uh, that is maybe in the urban and pre-urban areas. In the urban areas, they are more frequently. And uh, again, in Kenya, we have uh, motorbikes that deliver to people's homes. So once you have a relationship with a motor, uh, motorcycle guy, you get your gas finished and it delivers to you, whether you're at home or not, uh, you have an arrangement. So that sorts out... Uh, like a last mile delivery is, is system uh, in, in Kenya, and uh, I think the same thing applies to Rwanda. So is, you do not necessarily have to have multiple cylinders. Indeed, most customers don't have uh, more than one cylinder. A few of us have more than one. Thank you. If I may clarify, so what happens now is that because the consumers own the cylinders, they are at liberty to procure three, four, five cylinders in their houses and store gas. And actually that was very predominant because we could have cases where there's a shortage of LPG and then people would have to fall on what they've stored in their homes. But with cylinder recirculation model, as Elizabeth is saying, you don't actually also have to have multiple cylinders in your home. You can have one cylinder that is branded and owned by the company. When you run out, they come and do the exchange for you. Or you could, if you intend to have um, multiple brands in your house, you could go to maybe two brands just so for reliability and accessibility purpose. So we are also not pushing to have consumers own multiple cylinders in this new model. Um, you don't need to have that. The, br the companies will have to supply you with, a with their cylinders. Uh, one, one point about that is it's true, it's uh, one of the m main challenge for a marketer, so it's the company that owns the cylinder, branded with this logo, um, and the BCRM model, like sometimes needs to invest in three cylinders per customer. What does it mean is that we have 1,000 customers, each of them have one cylinder, so 1,000 cylinders are on the field with customers. Then there is like, for this one, to serve this 1,000 customers, we need five cylinders in each point of sales we have across the city, then we have the one we have in the refilling station. So we could have 2,000 cylinders on the balance sheet of the company with only 1,000 being paid or a deposit received, depending in, uh, in each country, um, and then, then collected from the customer. So it's an issue, actually, it's the biggest investment for a, uh, a marketer is to invest in these cylinders. A way to optimize that is to um, digitalize the, the fleet management, really, of the cylinders. So what we are trying to do we have a ratio of 1.4 cylinders per customer currently, and it means we need to tag and trace, and uh, other companies are, are doing that, even uh, uh, Express Gas in, in Ghana, uh, the, 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 the cylinder every time we send that to a new location. So we can really on time deliver the stock on the point of sales or doing the home deliveries as well. The challenge with home deliveries is everything comes with a cost, so doing home deliveries is a little more costly than organizing a, an efficient uh, uh, retail network, so it's also, and this cost needs to be paid by someone, the end user, uh, and um, and when we talk about uh, affordability, it could be an issue. It's a nice service, but a service comes with a cost. Uh, maybe if you agree, if you allow me to disagree a little bit, the number of traders a company requires is uh, dependent on how far the customers are, the distance, 
and how many days the customers take to use the cylinders. So if your customers are going to take uh, three months to, okay, let's say one month to use a cylinder, then you just need to have enough cylinders to sell for the following day. So that could be like one that is. Uh, maybe one more cylinder for the pipeline. So not necessarily one in a four, or one in 10. And I do not mean to say, I'm just saying uh, based on my experience. And I'm saying this so that investors are not scared that we need so many cylinders. We don't. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Tram. I have time for one more question. Um, I've been given the eye here by Mr. Simba. Yeah, so one more question from the audience, then we'll. Um, thank you. I have this one question. Um, I think those of us from Kenya know Paygo. And I keep wondering, why is it so hard for maybe governments to consider such a, an approach to LPG usage in rural areas? The way Paygo cylinders are, it's a normal cylinder, but I think it's metered. So if you have uh, 50 shillings, let me use Kenyan, half a, half a dollar, you can only buy gas worth that amount, you know? And we know most consumers or users of, like those of us who cook in the rural areas, I have half a dollar today or right now. I do not, I can't use or refill the whole cylinder. What is so hard maybe with governments using such approaches for the rural markets or the rural consumers? I think it is not a hard thing to do, but remember Louis mentioned the cost of the meter on the cylinder. It is quite expensive, and so if you left it to private sector to manage it, they would add on the cost of servicing the meter, even coming to your house to come and exchange cylinders. So it needs to be looked at critically. Um, the objective is to help people pay as they cook, but the, the, the technology as it is right now, you know sometimes when technology is new, it is expensive until we start finding ways to make it cheaper. The technology as it is right now is a bit expensive, and so, I mean, there's been some pilots done in Accra, and I've gotten feedback that it's quite expensive, you know, even procuring and maintaining the meters and even having technicians, because sometimes you have to match it to the network in the neighborhood. Some are allowing you to pay with mobile money and all of that. So the whole system needs to be re looked at critically. It's a very efficient solution, but the cost, um, we have to look at the cost so that we're not getting um, an, an adverse effect on the price of LPG to low income consumers. But it is a very fantastic solution. You just have to make sure when you're implementing it, it's not adding on to the cost to the final consumer. So I think it's important to also understand that for the economics here, it's similar to rural elect electrification, right? There's a cost of rolling out. There's a capital cost that's involved. And companies are hesitant to do it because the consumers themselves, they probably won't use that much at least at first. So if you can't guarantee a, a substantial market, then it's, it's really not worth it. It's a hard sell, you know? The, you know and, and how do we encourage well, rural electrification? We, we subsidize it, right? There's this lifeline tariff in many, many countries where the first few units are very, very cheap um, because you know, it's considered like you know, a, 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 a fundamental need. So maybe that's something you could also consider, you know, like where the rural consumers will get the first few units of cooking at a subsidized rate, and that would also encourage, you know, possibly to use more. So it's not just rolling it out, not just subsidizing the, um, the infrastructure in this case, but also, you know, maybe the first few units of use. But then the targeting becomes, you know, really hard. And the, the population's dispersed, it's spread around, you know, so I, I think of it as like the rural electrification problem, uh, but just transfer it to, to gas. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've had a very interesting session. So I get to ask a question, since that's why I hold the mic. I get to ask the last question. And this is a question for all the panelists. And essentially, the question is this. It's a bit long, but I can repeat it. It's, Given that the prevailing definitions of climate justice do not always capture the priorities, challenges, and perspectives of low-emitting African countries, how do we reframe policies so that development funders and financiers support a just transition which must include LPG for clean cooking. <laughs> Go ahead. Wow. So, I mean, I think first, just to you know, look look back at the work that I contributed to this this conversation, um, it's 
you know, you can lead with the idea that, okay, this is not a climate loss. This is, at, you know, possibly neutral, possibly a win, depending on how we interpret the uncertainty, okay? So that's, that's one. So that, that argument should be off the table. Um, and then you could talk about, okay, is this the best solution? Um, or is this one of a possible suite of solutions? Uh, and I believe the latter, you know, we all might have our, our, our own opinions here, um, but it certainly should absolutely be on the table and if arguments against it being on the table are climate related, then, then we should take those away. Uh, I'll pass on to people who maybe know more about the actual marketing. Okay, but um, the conversation about a just transition around the world is to make sure that we're transiting to maybe net zero emissions with um, making sure that there's fairness and equity. And so the first point I'd like us to look at is we must have a bespoke thing for perhaps the African continent or for your country. We cannot adopt whatever is in another country blindly. So if I want to, if you, if I want to push just transition or use an LPG as a tool for just transition in Ghana, I'm going to look at the Ghana situation, um, like the conversation we've had. What are the consumers in Ghana like? What's the socioeconomic status? How do we make sure LPG uptake is faster in the Ghanaian way whilst we're still achieving the climate gains? And we mentioned pay as you cook have a way to have a targeted subsidy, touch on the prices to make sure the price is low, um, improve upon your affordability and accessibility, pace the time because um, there are also jobs on the line and so you have a way to transition the jobs into new roles and transition them into new skills. Okay, so you must look at what pertains in your country, what pertains on the continent of Africa, like you said. If we're looking at um, African DFIs, LPG DFIs um, to, to finance um, our continent, um, fueling energy in our continent and fueling LPG in our continent, we must look at our situation, make sure that socioeconomically our people are covered, and then also make sure that we're transitioning such that there are no harsh, you know, stoppage on people's expectations. Uh, I would like to say that uh, based on the research that has been done by Professor Bailey's and uh, others, uh, Eliza Pozzolo and Dan Pope and so on, that uh, already showed that LPG has a cooling effect on the environment, it is reducing pollution, it is really something that we must work on. The second thing that's related to this is that um, it is so easy to do LPG, the infrastructure is easy, it's not uh, like electrification, you don't have to have a cable in each and every home. You can have a small cylinder, 6 kilograms or 13 kilograms or 12 kilograms, whatever, and uh, have it uh, delivered to people's homes, so it's quite easy. And uh, if we are talking of uh, just transition, we want, it means we want the whole world to move at the same pace. We don't want to be left, Africans are left behind. The rest of the world is using natural gas and is using electricity for cooking, and Africans are still using biomass, and we are saying that we want to move. We want to be at the same level with everybody else. And for me, it appears, and for Global LPG Partnership, it appears that LPG really is the fuel that is going to help uh, Africans move with the rest of the world to a clean cooking fuel. Thank you. Um, yeah, me, it will be about the carbon credits. Um, we are very sad at Bbox because we have chosen LPG as a clean cooking fuel. And LPG is not recognized enough on the carbon credit perspective as a clean cooking fuel. So the, the, the main, the big challenge, as you have all said, is that we, we have to displace charcoal and quickly because charcoal is leading deforestation. Charcoal is emitting like eight times or five times more CO2 than LPG. Uh, and so it's an urgency, but we have improved cook stoves that benefit from carbon credit with a charcoal improved cook stove, which is fine. We have uh, ethanol that all, also have its challenges in terms of sustainability that benefit heavily from carbon credits. And then LPG is left behind where we could really leverage these carbon credits to make the stoves super affordable. And then we can really scale LPG across uh, the continent and really having LPG as a transition fuel for the next 30 years, 50, 40 years, 50 years, and then we do like Nepal is doing in um, two, two hours ago the, um, on, on the previous panel, someone from Nepal govern Nepalese government was saying, we are now reducing the LPG and we are increasing the clean cooking with electricity because now they have reached uh, like a universal access to a reliable grid, which is fine. And I think we should organize this transition for the same kind of transition for Africa. And we should continue to lobby 
for having more carbon credits and uh, more subsidy on the acquisition, so reducing the cost of the stove. Th thank you very much. Uh, the reason I asked that question is, um, I, so I, I dress like an investment banker because I actually believe you need to follow the money. Any project without financing remains an idea. Consequently, we need to have, take actionable steps to put in place actionable frameworks for LPG investments across Africa. So for example, working with the Global LPG Partnership, ARDA is working to put in place a dedicated LPG sector development fund that can go after some of that six billion that we need and put it in projects that are needed for the continent so we can actually start to move the needle in a way that makes sense. Ladies and gentlemen, can you please give a round of applause to this excellent panel? Um,